Hi everyone, I'm Stephen and welcome to Audio Nautica. In my last video on building this SIMEF amplifier, I went through the basics of the enclosure and I noted that I'm going to have to drill and tap the heat sink. So firstly, in terms of the equipment that I'm going to need to do this, it's critical that the holes are straight. So I'm going to use, I've got this Dremel 4000 rotary tool and then I've got the uh, drill press attachment. So uh, that will allow me to make sure that I can get very controlled movement. Um, so there's this little lock just here that allows me to set how far this will go down and it will not go any further. Uh, and also obviously that the hole is perfectly vertical. It's absolutely critical. So, um, I've only kind of like done a couple of test holes. I'm going to do another test hole now. If you've never done this before, I would suggest don't practice on your real heat sink. So I've got this um, scrap heat sink that I had lying around here in the workshop. Um, I would suggest that just go and buy a heat sink like this and that will give you something to uh, test on, which will be um, a whole lot better than ruining it on your first heat sink because you probably will ruin the first few attempts that you make. Um, that's necessary to learn how not to ruin it. Uh, in terms of other equipment that you'll need, um, so this is for a three millimeter uh, tapped hole. So it'll take M3 screws. So two and a half millimeter drill and uh, the taps. So I've got two taps. This is what they call a tapered tap. Now if you're drilling all the way through something then you can use this tapered tap but because of the way that it's um, tapered obviously the first part of it won't fully tap the hole so it's designed to get you started and it makes it easier because of the taper. Um, so if you're going straight through you can just keep going till you get to the point where you're at the full width but if you're doing a um, like a blind hole or a hole that doesn't go all the way through, then you'll need to use one of these taps. And uh, this is called a bottoming tap and it doesn't have that taper. So it's much harder to get started if you try to do it with this. That's why you get it started with this and finish it with this. So that's what we're going to do. And if this was a real heat sink, another thing that you could do is um, put some of this like blue painter's tape over because that'll stop the swarf from um, scratching the heatsink but I'm not going to worry about this one so again I've just made sure that I have got the um, drill going down no further than I want it to go I position this where I want that to be yep start this Okay, so that's my hole. Um, if you wanted absolute precision, probably clamping things would be a really good idea. Right, so you do need to use some lubrication and I've just got this little um, eyedropper thing, laboratory eyedropper thing. And I'm using um, just ordinary dish dishwashing detergent um, you can use oil but I figured this would be the easiest to clean up because you just clean it up with water and there's nothing left okay so getting it started very gently I feel like that that has has started. I can just feel from with the resistance that it has started. 
Now, because this is gonna be a blind hole, I don't wanna go really any further than I have to. Because if I contact the bottom of the hole, then it'll just strip the threads out and that'll be the end of the hole. The hole will be useless. So I've only gone far enough, I believe, to get it started. And now I'll just change change to the other tap let's see how we go So basically I can feel some resistance but not much resistance. I can feel that it's cutting. This is a ratcheting handle that I'm using. Okay, I'm just feeling the resistance increasing and that could be because of the build up of um, shavings. So I'm just going to pull out and there are quite, yeah, quite a few shavings on there, which is what we'd expect. So I can just clean those away. guy okay I'm feeling a big increase in resistance there so I'm going to withdraw now I honestly think that this would actually be probably fine to use because there's I can tell there's quite a bit of thread there but I don't know whether I actually made it to the bottom or not now I can actually tell that with my microscope. So anyway, what I'm just going to do is go and wash this, just get all of this out of the hole so the hole's clean, and then see what I can see. Okay, well that was all very interesting and a big learning experience actually, um, because there was basically a heap of swarf down the bottom of the hole. I'm not sure whether it's from when I drilled it or from the tapping process, but basically the thread's about two thirds of the way down. Um, and it would take a, a screw quite satisfactorily, it would work really quite well, but just for the purposes of this exercise, and this is quite a deep hole as well, but for the purpose of this exercise, I just want to try to get this one right. But yeah, the key is, is, is again, filling that resistance. If I'd have kept going, something bad would have happened, I think. Okay, so here we go. So I'm actually using the, I'm not using the handle and the ratchet, I'm using here. So obviously that will help me much better feel resistance. Okay, it does feel pretty tight. Is it because of Swarf? I wouldn't have thought it's gone far enough to hit the bottom, but it might have. I mean, this is a pretty deep hole as well. I don't think I'll be going this deep on my real heat sink. It's definitely cut. Just have to clean this out again and see what we look like. Okay, so I'm looking through the microscope and yeah, you can see the thread goes all the way to the bottom of the wall. And then you see the, the bit that the, the drill itself made. So it wasn't possible to go any further than that. So I felt that resistance and that was it, that was the end. 
So that hole is actually looking pretty much about as perfect as you can get uh, doing this by this, you know, non-precision by hand. I'm actually really, really pleased with that. So, yeah, that's how it's going to be. Um, but, yeah, I think the microscope makes a huge difference just to be able to inspect the hole. Um, I wouldn't have been able to see with the naked eye all that swarf that was down the bottom. So, yeah, just by taking my time, inspecting what was going on, getting the junk out, um, yeah, has enabled me to get this perfect hole. Right, so this is the plan for how I'm going to do this. I've designed a drilling template as a piece of circuit board that has the holes in it that I need. So I got this from PCBWay and it has two and a half millimeter holes which will match the two and a half millimeter drill but this will be a single use template. I've actually got five of these because that's how many uh, came from PCBWay. But basically, ideally this should be clamped down, but I can't clamp it down because the heat sink is sitting on the bench. Um, so basically what I'm going to do is these two holes are the critical ones for holding this down. Um, they'll mount the real PCB. So I'm going to drill and tap both of these holes first. Then I'll put screws in to hold the board down. But to put the screws in, I'll have to drill these out to 3mm to take the screw. But anyway, that's the general idea. So, um, let's see if I can be brave and drill this first hole anyway. Just fingers crossed that that's right. Okay, we are back and I have got these two heat sinks drilled and tapped, which I'm really, really pleased about. This was not easy, but neither was it hard. It required a lot of patience and there were a few learnings along the way, uh, which I'll share with you now. But um, yeah, so first of all, the, the drilling template that I used um, was absolutely critical to getting the job right. So um, yeah, I drilled these holes first, then secured them in place just with some standoffs, then drilled the other mounting holes, secure the whole thing, then drilled the holes for the um, transistors. So this worked really, really well. Um, I designed this um, to be made with PCB way. So I'm gonna make this available on um, PCBWay's shared website so that um, that can be something that you can order yourself if you want to uh, drill something like this. Uh, in terms of drilling the actual holes themselves, yeah, the learnings that I found is mainly that you need to consider these taps to be consumable devices. They, they will wear. Um, you do need to take your time. Magnification can really, really help because like long bits of aluminium will kind of like get jammed in there. And when they do, they can wear the tool and they can also damage the hole as well. So if something doesn't feel right, then you need to withdraw and see what's going on. So that's where magnification comes in really, really handy. Um, I used my microscope to look down the hole to see what was going on, to see how far I had to go. So I wasn't just kind of like blindly, you know, tapping away. Um, but it was also really handy to see what was going on with what the state of my actual tap was. So what I found is, is yeah, it's easy to get the big bits out of these little grooves, but over time, these tiny, 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 like microscopic particles of aluminium would get stuck in between the teeth. And that's because of the um, detergent that I was using as a lubricant. It would kind of like bind them all together, if you like. So I could just clean most of those out with a brush, but 
yeah, you could tell with the naked eye that it didn't look clean, but that's all you could see. So magnification, really, really important. You probably don't need a microscope, but some sort of magnification to see what's going on is important. And so, as I mentioned uh, before, using two taps, this is the, the bottoming tap, and the other tap is this one up here. This is the tapering tap, so you use a tapering tap to get it started. But for a blind hole like these ones, um, you have to use a bottoming tap to finish off the job. And um, this tap is basically now worn out after having this done this job. So I'd thoroughly recommend that you get two of these, consider it to be a disposable part. And, um, but I'm really happy with how this has turned out. You can see that the aluminium itself is quite thick. Um, I didn't want to go through, so the very first tap that I did was a little bit, the hole was a little bit short. But um, the rest of them have turned out really, really well. But I've got these beautiful uh, tapped holes, but on this side, whoops, on this side of the heat sink, there's nothing to be seen. So it will just look absolutely fantastic when it is in the amplifier. Um, again, also, as I mentioned, the drill press, really important in making sure that the holes are straight and not at an angle because you're in big trouble then. And also, the other thing to consider is, is the variable thickness of the devices that are being through, screwed in. Um, because I wanted to be certain with the standoffs, so I bought my standoffs from AliExpress, they turned up pretty quickly. I got 10 millimeter and I got different thread lengths. So I got a four millimeter thread and a five millimeter thread, just to be sure that they would fit. And then with the um, screws that I'm gonna use for mounting the transistors, obviously you gotta think that the packages have different heights. So the height of the package determines um, how far, you know, if you use the same length screw, because the heights are not the same, you'll have a different amount of thread sticking out the bottom of the transistor. So what might work for the big, thick transistors that go on the ends won't necessarily work for the three, these three little guys in the middle. So I bought myself a range of lengths of um, M3 stainless steel screws. So that means I won't have problems with um, the lengths of the threads. Also, I found too that with these, um, these blind holes, obviously because they don't go through, the swarf tends to build up in them. So you do need to clean that out fairly regularly. The magnification can help a lot in seeing how clean it is. But what I found works best is to actually let it dry out. So it's got to be dry because of the, wood, the water will hang on to bits of aluminium. I've got this hand blower that I use for my watchmaking. Once the hole is dried out, if I just kind of like put the end over that, not completely over the hole, I've got to leave, leave a little gap so the air can get back out. So just doing this, it will blow out the um, swarf. So that's an easy way of getting all those loose bits of aluminium out of those holes. So as I mentioned, my plan is to turn these transistors around so that they're bottom mounted and this will allow me to mount this board flush on the heatsink. Um, my initial plan was to just use solder braid to take these out. Um, that plan didn't really go to plan. So I've been wanting to get a um, desoldering tool for quite some time. And I just got to the point with this job where I absolutely have to have one to be able to do it. So I ended up getting this guy. I got this Pros Kit SS331 on AliExpress. It was 206 Australian dollars, including freight. I actually had my eye on like, the Hacko one. The Hacko ones are, are really, really good, but they're quite a bit more expensive, which is why I hadn't bought one. I just couldn't afford it, but I need one to do this job. So I'm actually really, really impressed with this thing. Um, Pros Kit is a reasonably well-known brand. Okay, they're not up there with Hacko. But yeah, I'm pretty confident that with this tool, I'll be able to get these transistors out and so be able to mount this board on the heatsink. So that's the next step. So we now have all of the transistors mounted on the heatsink. So the next trick is going to be to bend these legs at 90 degrees up so that they will line up with the holes in the PCB. Okay, guys, have a look at this. I think this is absolutely fantastic if I do say so myself. So I've got the legs are mounted. It wasn't all that hard. Basically what I did is I just used the used one of these old um, drilling templates and I just used it as a um, folding jig. So 
folded the ones that are out this way furthest first, which is all of these except for these three in the middle. Then I just moved this back a little bit, a millimetre or so, and folded the three in the middle. Uh, and then just a little bit of fine tweaking to allow the board to drop down over the top. So I haven't soldered these in yet, but I cleaned the board up previously, um, got rid of all the flux and so on, so that's looking quite nice. So I just need to solder these in, and this is basically good to go. I've got a couple of little spaces just in this end. There's no mounting holes on this end, and I just feel more comfortable having something soldered under there that when you're pushing down on the board, it's not you know, all going onto these um, legs of these transistors. So um, the jig was designed for those. And because there's no mounting hole, I just put a little bit of like uh, vulcanizing tape just underneath that just as a little bit of insulation because I just don't want it to kind of like rub through to you know, potentially copper or something which would short something to chassis so we don't want that to happen. Okay guys we are back so I have got the module bolted to the heatsink as we saw before I have got the transistors are now soldered in so I can do some initial testing uh, like this it's going to be a little bit easier to access the circuit board uh, also, I don't have all the bits and pieces yet for the power supply. So I've got this connected up to my PS503 um, power supply module. There's a suggested um, test mode to use a DC lab power supply in the data sheet that comes with the uh, SIMF Type S uh, board. So I've got this set for plus or minus 20 volts, which is the highest this will go anyway. I've got it current limited for 300 milliamps, is what the procedure suggests. So I just made up some little um, quick connect test leads to allow me to strap that over to my power supply. And so I guess um, now's as good a time as any to do the good old smoke test. The um, input is shorted there is nothing on the output, the output is connected to the multimeter. So what I'm hoping to see is um, a low DC offset voltage and if that looks good then we can check the, um, the bias. So yeah, let's, um, let's light the blue touch paper as they say. Well, the current limit hasn't kicked in, so that's good. Incidentally, the fuses in this are 6.3 amps, so um, they're well above what our current limit is set to at the moment, so wouldn't expect any issues there. And yeah, okay, so the Keithley is reading the output, and so I'm reading 34 millivolts, so according to the procedure, um, use the multimeter to measure the voltage between speaker ground and speaker out. This should be less than 50 millivolts, which it is. 34.6, so we say 35 millivolts um, DC offset. Okay, well, so far so good. Let's um, just turn the power off and I will um, switch this around so that we can have a look at the bias. So we measure the bias across R29, which it doesn't actually have a designator on it, but I checked with Harrison and it's this one here. Before I turn that on, I'm just going to go and double check my picture that I got from Harrison just to make sure that is the right resistor. Okay, so I have confirmed that that is the correct resistor to check the bias on. So let's see what we've got here. So the procedure says to preset uh, R29, the trim pot, sorry, R28, set the trim pot R28 to mid range, which I have done. Procedure says that it's 25 turns, it's actually 30 turns, so I'll set it to 15 turns, which is midway, it won't really matter that much. 
as long as it's you know more or less midway. Um, what I'm wanting to do right now is just make sure that I have a sensible bias um, because it's all going to change anyway when I put the real power supply in because I'm driving it with a higher voltage. This is only plus or minus 20, so I'll drive it more than that um, when I have the real power supply, which will change all the bias. So there's no point getting too excited about it. Also, we're setting bias. You want to let it run for probably at least an hour, I would say. Um, before really trying to tweak the bias. So anyway, let's see what this says. It says we want between 10 and 20 millivolts. Um, so for lower voltage rails, that's us, we want higher bias, but again, I'm not really that stressed about it. So let's just turn it on and see what we have. doesn't seem right at all. 0.1 millivolts doesn't seem correct. It's going up now. Might be just because of the um, really low supply. Yeah, okay, there we go, it's coming up now. 10 millivolts. Yeah, I think for the purposes of this testing, I'm just gonna leave it sort of fairly low. Because again, as I said, it's all going to change. Um, but anyway, that's 10 millivolts there. Um, okay. So that all seems pretty good. So I think the next step is to actually put a load on it and a signal into it and see what happens. Okay, so I have got a 8 ohm resistor hooked up to the output. And I have got a function generator hooked up to the input. So let's turn the power on. Let's turn the signal generator on. And let's get a sensible Look at that. Let's wind the system volume down a bit. The input level down a bit, there we go. Awesome. Okay, well that seems to be working all right. Let's see what our test procedure says. Use a function generator to apply 20 hertz, one kilohertz and 20 kilohertz. Okay. 
there's 20 hertz. There's one kilohertz. Looks pretty good. And there's 20 kilohertz. I'm not too worried about this, this spiky noise that you can see. That's coming from somewhere else. Um, I'm not quite sure where that's coming from, but it was there before I turn anything on. That seems pretty good. So far, so good. Okay, I've just put my test speaker on, so let's see what happens. That seems to be working. Okay, well it makes music, can't really do any more than that because of copyright reasons. Um, so yeah, this is all pretty encouraging I think. Okay, so this is really encouraging. We've demonstrated that uh, we're getting sensible readings out of this board. It makes music, which is kind of really good for an amplifier board. So I think we'll wrap this video up for now. Thanks so much for watching my video. Please do subscribe to my channel and turn on alerts so that you'll find out when the next video in this series is ready to go. So off camera, I'll um, get the other channel up to this stage. And then the next video, I think we'll be putting this back into the enclosure and um, getting some of the other bits and pieces in. I need to get the speaker protection boards in as well so there's still quite a few things to do before this amplifier is ready to go please do subscribe to my channel give me a like i love to read your comments down below i've got a patreon you can support both of my channels over at patreon patreon.com slash audio nautica and you might also like to check out my other channel, Watch Out, which is about watchmaking. So thank you again so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you on the next video. Bye for now.